Jeff Kunagi live here at Citizen Television. Speaking about the housing issue, the building and construction issue, Nairobi plan going forward. Are we going this way or are we going this way? That's the question. Here with former Nairobi town clerk Philip Kisia in the house and the president of the Architectural Association of Kenya, Florence Nyole. Now, before the break, Florence, I was saying, 2019 census said that Nairobi's population was about 4 million and change. Five years later, I know it's gone up exponentially. Do we have the infrastructure for that? Can we cope with that? Clear or is it sinking the city? Clearly, we have to do something about it. It's possible to house the numbers, even if we talk about the 10 million that has been projected. Because currently, you could be talking about 6 million day day population and much less in the night because we've got also the other counties uh, that surround Nairobi. Uh, the most important thing is if you're looking at issues to do with housing, for instance, we need to build more housing for sure. It's a big problem. But at the same time, we also need to create what you call a, a, a city that has value for its citizens in terms of the economic um, opportunities that exist for, uh, for, the, for, for the citizens of this, of this, of this city. Um, what you find is that most people in most of these informal areas, they are living close to where they can find um, economic value. Maybe they're going to industrial area for work, uh, or maybe they're able to access uh, other economic opportunities. And so, you know, as part of planning is to also make sure that we actually increase opportunities uh, for economic activity in this city. Like we should really, really be focusing on uh, making infra uh, manufacturing, you know, bolstering manufacturing within the city of Nairobi. We have a, we have fantastic opportunities uh, as, as a nation to be able to do that. And I think we should be able to be uh, making that even uh, much more uh, progressive. We also need to start thinking about the common Mananchi. What do they derive from the city? If they are experiencing uh, challenges when it comes to public transport, for instance, what are we doing about it? We're continuously building roads for private cars, but we're completely forgetting about public transportation, where people are walking and cycling and even being able to move from point A to B, or even using what you call uh, you know, appropriate public transport like commuter rails and bus rapid transit. I'm seeing we've had this story about the famous red line on Thicker Road. No, they called it pink lipstick. Pink lipstick. <laughs> 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 what, what have we done about it? Yeah. I was in Dar es Salaam just the other week, and trust you me, I was there, and, and I used the, the BRT. It's very efficient. You can move from one part of the city to the other part of the city in just a matter of minutes. I do not have to go through the congestion and the traffic that, uh, that, that exists in Dar es Salaam. And I'm asking myself, as Nairobi, can't we take leadership in creating opportunities that enable people to move from point A to B, either where they're, where they're looking for work, where they're looking for economic opportunities, or looking for schools, and so on and so forth. So that is why planning is a very important thing. And we do support... 100% as the Architectural Association, a compact city where we can densify and go as high up as we need to as long as what you call Vituqua ground is working, mm -hmm. that there are good roads, there is <coughs> sufficient public spaces uh, for, for the citizens to you know, explore and breathe, you know, that uh, buildings are actually it start def being defined by what you call the building code, that there's sufficient uh, ventilation, sufficient lighting in those buildings, that we have proper infrastructure, both uh, for vehicles but also for the walking and the cycling monarchy at the end of the day. But we also need, and we should never forget, that people derive, people live in the city because they're deriving an economic value from that city. And so we should not just go ahead and build housing and residential units and forget the reason why people are in the city is to etch, um, you know, are living out of the city. And so planning around that uh, is, is very important. Yeah. And so for me, I believe it's possible that we're able to uh, house uh, the numbers that we're talking about, the population we're talking about, and which is continuing to grow. DARS BRT is working? Absolutely, and they're on their phase four, I think, or phase three, mm. I think. Philip, isn't that a shame? Yeah. Well, it is, because um, at least uh, in Nairobi by 2014 should have started rolling out this uh, new plan. And what uh, Madam President is talking about is, is, is these are things that are doable. Because um, uh, in, in, in the new plan, they have uh, proposed that we have a, a light rail system uh, you know, um, uh, to have an integrated approach. So you have um, uh, the rapid bus trans transport system uh, feeding into the light rail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, of course, we do away with uh, a small capacity vehicles. Right. We are not saying that we'll face, but we'll face them out systematically. 
we will take them where they belong. So we'll say beyond a certain boundary, we don't need um, small capacity vehicles into, um, into, into this particular uh, uh, jurisdiction. So these are things that can be done. But there are other fundamental issues that need to be done before we uh, you know, think of having this compact city that we're talking about. You can imagine, Jeff, this city generates about, um, oh, I think that is close to 3,000 uh, metric tons of uh, solid waste. Where is that waste going to? Where is it going to? We are using methods that were used more than 50 years ago, more than 50, 60, 70 years ago, to dispose of our waste. We are dumping. In fact, now we don't even have somewhere to dump. People have moved on. If you look at uh, progressive um, uh, cities like uh, Kuala Lumpur and Singapore, they are using modern ways of disposing of uh, solid waste. They are recycling solid, solid waste. They are reusing uh, waste, converting waste into um, other products like uh, energy and so, on, and so on and so forth. But here, you are talking about building. You have not talked about how you will dispose of your waste. You are still disposing your waste in Dondora in a very rudimental fashion. You are talking about building skyscrapers and you don't have water to pump into those skyscrapers. You don't have it. You are talking about um, uh, you know, expanding or building houses and building skyscrapers. Yet, a basic thing like a public transport has not been addressed. I mean, what are we talking about? So there are issues that we need to deal with now, not tomorrow. The skyscrapers will follow. But you cannot have a situation where you are pushing to have uh, a skyscrapers and the infrastructure to follow. It doesn't happen that way. And I think uh, Madame gave a very good analogy. Uh, you can't walk into a bathroom with your clothes. <laughs> You'll be defeating the purpose of uh, getting into the bathroom. <laughs> and imagine you're on the 20th floor, 30th floor, and the power goes out. Yeah. Or in the lift. Yes. In the lift, yeah. No backup generator. No backup Even generator. if you have it, it fails. I'm so, so as professionals, yes. what would you advise the governor? He's probably watching right now. What would you tell him? Absolutely. I think the first thing the governor needs to do is to actually ac allow us to speak to him. Let me start from there. Mm. I've been president for about a year now. I've asked him for, for courtesy calls. He has, not, he has completely not ignored our request to actually meet him and discuss these very issues that we are discussing today because we are professionals. And it's, it's not even just about ourselves as architects. You know, AAK has got engineers, planners, quantity surveyors, eight professionals in total in the built environment. And we have solutions for this city. Let's have a meeting. Let's have a caucus, not only as ourselves as AAK, but all the other associations in the built environment where we can sit and caucus and thrash out. These issues are not very alien. We are able to resolve them quite easily. And like you're saying, we actually just need that goodwill to come from him He's, at the end of the day, the buck stops with him when you talk about Nairobi. He's the boss. And so he needs to at least give us a listening ear and try and have goodwill to start, even if it means piloting some of these um, neighborhood area plans like uh, Kilimani or, uh, or uh, Kasarani. Ka Kasarani or Karengata or even talking about Eastlands. Like, for instance, Mukuru now has a special planning uh, zone for themselves. Why, why should that not happen uh, for, for areas, even areas where things have gone haywire? Like right now, they, they experienced the fire in Embakasi, for instance. That's a place that we should be going there and planning and making sure that happens. But I think second and most important is that we need to go back to professionalizing our country. What has happened is that development in the city and in many other urban areas, including other major cities in, 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 in Kenya, is going on without the input of professionals, without people ignoring professional advice. You find that, um, that the person who's calling the piper in this case is either the contractor or the developer. Mm. But the space of the professionals has been taken over because people don't, do not think that they need to professionalize, professionalize the services of construction. 
which actually begin with a client's idea and secondly it is the consultants in terms of architects engineers planners to help this client and developer to conceptualize their construction and then take it to the next level before it actually gets to the point of being implemented and so for us is also to 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 make um a really call to action especially to a governor but also even to the national government that we need to professionalize uh construction in this country planning in this country everything that we are doing we need to professional let the right people who are duly qualified to do the jobs uh in 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 our industry be the ones who are actually doing doing the jobs being the ones who are uh, involved in turning uh, this city around you know it is said that Kenya has uh, you know some of the highest um the highest the highly qualified professionals in the world why are we not making use of them yet they are there yet they are available if i give you a scenario Uh, there's a research that was done by NCA that talked about only 25% of the buildings and the construction that is going on in the country being under the watchful eyes of professionals what's happening to the rest of the 75% who is doing them it means people who are not duly qualified are actually handling this construction and that's why you end up finding that over and above not having plans which is already uh, in terms of a bare minimum it's it's a negative we're having buildings collapse because the people who are in charge are actually not duly qualified to be able to um you know supervise and make sure that the correct thing is being done in this in these buildings and so that's that's one of the really major crises that we have as professionals in the built environment yeah absolutely philip imagine living in a gated community you've invested heavily in it and all of a sudden on your perimeter wall is a 20 story structure coming up and they can see you even when you're in the bathroom they can see you how would that make you feel terrible terrible i can tell you jeff i mean um and that is why um i think the professionals are fighting to have uh zoning and zoning policies respected and that is why i think we're also saying that uh, people must people in um, uh, those areas must be consulted because they are the ones who are living there they are the ones who have invested they are the ones who are paying taxes there is no way you can ignore these people okay a city is not meant for buildings a city is actually meant for people so if you have buildings and you have no people living in that city will you call it a city and in fact uh, you know when madam president was talking and um, uh, you know and, 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 and i really was wondering my good friend the governor talked about having a skyscraper in certain areas up to 75 floors which is okay we are not objecting can we sustain But that can you can you imagine the the, the uh, preparedness in terms of a disaster mm. if a disaster occurred there's an earthquake right uh, there's a fire we can't even put off simple fires you know when we have a Uh, some fellows uh, cartels uh, uh, you know running uh, petroleum products uh, stations or not have you in, in, in certain uh, residential areas we can't even put them off we lose lives people get injured what about if we had a disaster and we have a 75 story building hmm. can you just imagine try and figure out it's catastrophic just i mean we can't even put up a uh, put up a fire on a 12 story building what about 75 and how many fire stations do we have how many personnel do we have are they trained are we really prepared for such a disaster so yes you can invite uh, our development partners from wherever from asia to come they'll put up a 75 story building in 3 uh, 4 years that can be done but what about the other auxiliary services that are required when are you going to put them up you can have those buildings but sooner or later you'll have nobody to occupy those buildings right now and people you see that is what has happened to cbd yeah and the new plan had actually recommended that we must re- revitalize cbd there are certain things that we needed to do to bring back life to cbd mm. okay uh, that that includes um, coming up with the railway city you know to uh, to be integrated with the cbd uh development of uh, including muduru at that area and what have you yeah. okay so we already have a live example of what can do if we don't plan properly cbd in another few years if we don't take care if we don't implement this good plan that we have cbd is going to die 
and there are billions of dollars that have been invested in CBD. CBD is becoming dysfunctional because of uh, negligence. We can't provide services, we can't provide proper roles, we can't, pro you know, the things that are required to make a CBD function. And therefore, people have moved out. Okay? Yeah. So we need to cure even what we have before we start thinking of putting up uh, uh, skyscrapers all over. You know, the same thing happened to Johannesburg CBD. Correct. Right. Then that was basically yes. crime, right? Yeah. So much crime. Everybody fled yeah. from the CBD, went into the suburbs. A lot of the young people now are going into the suburbs. Yeah. Or satellite cities. Yeah. Or different counties, Kajiado, Kiambu. Is that because they cannot withstand, I mean, the infrastructure, I mean, being in traffic four hours a day? It doesn't I mean, make sense. It, yeah. It doesn't make it sense. It doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. I think... First of all, it's just an, one, the economic factor, that you're trying to make money in the city and then live outside the city, where, where, where they call the bedroom counties mm -hmm. of Nairobi, the suburbs, the Kiambu, uh, Kajriado, Machakos uh, areas of, 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 of Nairobi. And that is because there they'll find a more affordable housing, which is key for them. Uh, they have a little bit more space. You know, they find buildings that are a little bit more accommodative. There might be four to six floors. It's much more comfortable. That's what most people will be used to. If you're going to live in Kilimani, first they pay rent, you know, exorbitant rents at the end of the day, because what has happened is that the developer wants to recoup their their money, they have to, you know, make sure that they hit their targets in terms of the return on investment and also to, you know, compensate for the value of land uh, in these areas. And what has happened is that because continuously this uh, compaction of the city, basically that's what it is, that we're densifying Kilimani, we're densifying areas like Kileleshwa, are becoming worse in terms of traffic, for instance. I think there's worse traffic if you're living within an area like Kilimani, Kileleshwa, than if you were to to move to Kiambu, you'll probably take similar amount of time from the CBD to your home uh, somewhere along Gitanga Road compared to just, you know, uh, driving down to a place like um, Tindigua or even down to Kasarani, Roisambu and so on and so forth. Even now with the express, we're going all the way to areas like Kitengela. And yeah. so traffic is a, is a major uh, contributor to the same. Now, in terms of, uh, when you talk about young people, they've also, you know, devised ways of not necessarily having to work in an office. Mm. So we have moved from, you know, a reporting to an, a physical office to reporting to, uh, you know, a virtual office daily, you know, through the computer. And so with this mode of virtual uh, working, then it makes it easier for them to be able to, you know, run their businesses. A lot of them are self-employed, so they do not necessarily need to, you know, report to uh, a physical location when it comes to working. And more and more we are finding that as we continue to grow as a nation, we also need to cater for that uh, group of group of people. They are the generation that will take over, you know, from the rest of us. I consider myself, I'm still a little bit young, <laughs> but there are people who are much younger than me who are in the Gen Z generation. Mm -hmm. For them, their phone is probably enough for work. Yeah. And so they don't necessarily need to live in an upmarket area to be able to etch a living. And so we, we, we need to start looking at the, the, the population also. And I think they, they are the majority in terms of the population. And we need to start thinking about them. If we're going to build a city that will uh, house the future of this country, then we also need to start thinking about them. For them, having spaces that are, you know, that uh, allow them to also socialize as they're working is more important rather than having this, you know, very expensive standalone uh, apartments, you know, at the end of the day, a place where they can just maybe live in the city during the week and over the weekend, they're out doing other activities you know, in other areas. And so we will continuously see that happening. What has also happened is that more and more people are are, uh, are able to actually develop, self-develop their own, their own property. They buy land, which is much more affordable outside the city, and build what you call self-build at the end of the day. And that's why even when it comes to the issue of affordable housing, is somebody saying, I'm already investing in my own house. I'm already paying mortgage for my own house. I already have a house and own a home. Why do I need to, you know, to have the government, uh, you know, figure out my own affordable housing while I can do it for myself? So these are very pertinent issues that we really need to think about, you know, in the long term at the end of the day and not just look at it as, you know, this next five, only five to 10 years, but we need to really think about the generation up to the, you know, year 2050 and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, we can't think that far. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of affordable housing, Philip, what do you think? Is it, can it work? 250,000 units a year? 
You know, um, again, uh, Jeff, the, we have no problem for the housing. As a matter of fact, I think it was in 2010 that uh, my administration, again, um, as one of the things that we had set to achieve, was to come coming up with a policy and, uh, and, and uh, we ran it through cabinet and it was approved. We want, and, and if you look at the new plan, actually the idea in Nairobi was to start building from Eastlands where we have, uh, you know, the densities are, are low, we have sufficient space and, uh, you know, uh, it was easier to start rolling out affordable housing from there uh, before moving to other areas. But right now the program is so haphazard People are running helter skelter everywhere. You're running to Kakamega, I don't know who will buy a house in Kakamega. You go to, you know, uh, Homer Bay. You want to build. It's okay, but uh, at the end of the day, who is going to occupy those houses? If you look at affordable, uh, how uh, the housing uh, requirements, over 60, 70 percent of the housing requirement is in Nairobi. Mm. So the focus should have been in Nairobi, not running all over the country and building uh, houses. But um, uh, Jeff, what I would say is that. Um, uh, we need housing because we host habitat, yeah. and habitat is about having ha um, um, homes that are sustainable, that uh, you know that, that are livable, uh, you know, for the generations to come. So um, uh, it would be sad if we don't even try and uh, meet uh, the basic objectives of uh, of habitat. But the, I think the biggest problem that most people are having with this affordable uh, housing thing. It is now, the houses are no longer affordable. When Uhuru Kenyatta started off this uh, affordable housing project, it did start with William Ruto, it started with the uh, Uhuru Wamugai. And his team lied to him. They went and told him, you know, if Philip Kisia's team was talking about building 150,000 units over 10 years, because that's what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You are the president of the Republic of Kenya. You can do a million houses. And I told them, it's a pipe dream. You will not deliver anything. Then it was scaled down to half a million. Then they stopped talking about numbers. They only talked about building affordable houses, which was okay. Because you lay a foundation for the future generations to come, for people who come later after you, to continue from where you, you had started. Yeah. Now, President William Ruto, again, has come up with a figure of 200,000 units. Uh, they are not free. If they were free, you would have got occupants. Mind you, the cheapest unit I've seen is about 3 million shillings. Mm. Now, how many Kenyans can afford 10% of 3 million shillings? How many? Not many. Not many. Very few. 1, 2, 3%. Maybe uh, 2, 3, maybe maximum 4%. So, who will buy the other houses that you are building? Leave alone that the cost, because they have already told us. The public secretary in charge of housing has told us that um, each unit will cost about 400,000 shillings. So I'm assuming it's 400,000, put in some interest for whoever is coming up with some little investment. These units should not be costing more than 600,000 shillings, if indeed the cost is 400. And I believe that is the right figure, because the land in, in, in this country ke called Kenya, over 50% of the cost of building a house is in land. Then, of course, the building materials and then labor. Okay? But close to 60% has been given to you free. Then it is even made worse that the Kenyans are actually financing the developer, the so-called developers. And I'm happy that this administration has stopped talking about investors because there are no investors in this program. There are no investors. Mm. The investors are the people of Kenya. Land is ours. The money to construct through taxes is ours. The deposit ours is ours. So who are these guys who are coming here just to build and making money? I think it needs to be reviewed. It is something that we want to support because we need um, affordable housing for everybody but not in the fashion that they have designed. Mm. It, it, it needs a review. We need to have an open discussion, yeah, in terms of um, what exactly people want, okay? And how can we finance it? Because as Madam President has said, if I already have a house, you're asking me to contribute to build a house for Mr. X. I mean, you should really give me a good reason as to why you should tax me. 
What other benefits am I getting? Because when you are taxed, and if you look at the Tax Taxation Act, it is very clear that the, the taxes you pay must benefit you s somehow, either Absolutely. directly or indirectly. Absolutely. On this housing thing, yeah. how are we be being bene uh, how are we benefiting if I'm not getting a unit? Okay? So no issues with um, affordable housing. Uh, they need to review and uh, they need to think about Mwanainchi and not how much money um, uh, the, the cartels and those people who have been lined up to build these houses are making. We need to have an open conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Folks, there's a lot of feedback coming through and now I'm going to go to that magic wall over there and uh, see what the folks are saying because everyone's being very vocal tonight, it's, which is good. It's good to see people's reactions. Uh huh. Okay. Here's a uh, Jan Yilima says, the entire Nairobi Eastlands sewage system is already overwhelmed with most estates having sewer flow in open drainages. The estates are not planned with new buildings coming up everywhere, every day. Agreed? Yep. Sure. Dennis Ariel says, we, do we follow the building codes as stipulated for in the constitution and zoning regulations? followed in Upper Hill area in Nairobi. The information we have is that we use international building standards bypassing the Kenyan codes. Is that true, Madam President? We use international building standards bypassing the Kenyan codes? We have a code. You have our we codes. have a code. We have our codes. Yes. And we are supposed to follow them. Yep. Yeah. And we do follow them, hopefully. Um, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Not to yeah. the letter. Atura Nimrod says, someone remind the authority that capital city planning for residential buildings is crucial for ensuring efficient common infrastructure. Building high-rise structures without a plan can strain resources, disrupt traffic flow, and affect quality of life for residents. Yeah, we said all that, huh? Oh, yeah. Hope Adara says, what happened to the thought and passion that went into developing the Nairobi Metro 2030 strategy? Who knows it exists? Which decision maker is reading it? Are we going to form another task force to write a new report to be stored unscathed on the shelves? <laughs> Gathering dust, like you said, Philip, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good Lord. So Nixon Dugira says, Nairobi and the plan. I highly hope expansion of the sewer lines as well as expansion of the main sewer treatment plant is embedded in the big plan for the many high rise buildings about to crop up. Sewerage is a big problem, isn't it? Oh, it is. Absolutely. Savai says, Kisi is talking about what he should have done they are the people who messed up easily with unplanned buildings everywhere. No space, no water, no drainage. Easily is a mess and buildings are still coming up every day. They blame you for that. <laughs> How? Uh, one, I mean, uh, that's an opinion and uh, it's welcome. But um, I was there for 36 months. I left you with a master plan, number one. Number two... At least I formed a secretariat to deal with building plan approvals. Mm. Number three, get back to history and even um, uh, and look at how many buildings uh, collapsed during my tenure and before and after. And then make your opinion. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Next is the Yasin says, lovely conversation on the bench tonight. While Nairobi is growing, Governor Sakaja should establish a Nairobi redevelopment task force and have architect Florence Nyole chair it. The Architectural Association of Kenya is in safe hands under her. Okay, Madam President, you hear that? And Newton Degwa says, we should establish an urban planning team to consider area demographics, road infrastructure, current and future population, available facilities, and exterior design to avoid the current ugly looking and similar designs. Let's emulate Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, and Dubai. Lots and lots of good feedback there from folks, very passionate, saying the same things that you guys are saying. We're gonna wrap it up now, moving forward. 
Philip Kisi, let me start with you. Moving forward, what is the plan? Where do we go from here? What is the ideal thing for this city that you and I grow, grew up in and we called it the green city in the sun? Home. Remember? Yeah, home. Florence I think was there, there, nowhere near no one there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you, I think, grew up in Malaga. I grew up in Atlanta. <laughs> there, there are people like me, PLO Lumumba and Barak, yes. Barak Muluka, yes. where it's land also. But we're here with you. <laughs> so there, there, there are two or three things that we can do. Number one is we already have a plan. Governor Sakaja has the best opportunity to make a difference, to make a change. Let him start uh, implementing that plan. Number two, my advice to him, which I'm giving for free, he has not asked for it, is that um, he should stop, stop this zero mentality approach to management. That's an approach that we all seem to have, that you always want to start from zero. And that is why you find good things that were done. We find Vision 2030 that was rolled out by uh, Emeritus Mwai Kibaki. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't make reference to it. Yet it's a document that uh, was not formulated by Kibaki. Kibaki just happened to be the, uh, the driver at that time. So we need to stick to what has been there. We need to build on our blocks. Yeah? So let um, my friend uh, 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 do that. And there are quick wins. Within that plan, for example, I don't know how far they've gone the rail city. I don't know how far they've gone with the issue of solid waste management. Mm. Those are some of the quick wins. I don't know how far they've gone with transport, uh, public transport. Uh, when at least uh, uh, President Duhur was there, uh, I think the, he uh, acquired some buses and they marked some roads. So we had started, but that has stalled again. Uh, I don't know how far they've gone with revitalizing CBD, uh, you know, so that we can start having life again uh, within CBD. I don't know what they're doing in creating other centers like Madama said in Kasarani, Karen, uh, and, and, and those other places. Um, and then, of course, um, the issue of water, the um, Northern Collector uh, Tunnel. And we were supposed to expand the other infrastructures we have in Kiambu, Moranga, and what have you. Because we cannot talk about population and building high, uh, skyscrapers. Then we don't have basic, basic, basic things like water. How can we have a city without water? How can you run that city? And a city that was built on a swamp. Yes. Remember? Now, yes. Then finally, this is the uh, third cycle of the dev devolution. We're actually in the third cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay? We should be getting better and better. But from what I can see, we're getting worse. So when time comes, I think let us stop uh, crying after the fact. Let us make right decisions. Because... Any decision you make has a consequence. So bear with that consequence. Yeah. yeah. For instance, you get the last word. Thank you so much, Jeff, for having us. Um, I'm sure it's, it's wonderful that even after I've left the AGM, I'm sure I've gained some you know, good ground with my members. Having no, no regrets leaving the no AGM regrets or, or dinner party. Yeah, it's for a good cause. I think at AK, the first thing I'd, I'd like to say is that uh, let's professionalize our city, really. Let's have professionals in charge and in place, you know, duly qualified people who have experience, people who've, who've also traveled the world. They've seen great things out there and they're able to bring it back. And at AK, we push what we call the Jeunam Jengo Initiative, which asks if you're building, then you need, an, uh, you know, professionals on board. We also have what we call the Mulikam Jengo Initiative, where we say, if you see something wrong, say something. Like right now, we've seen something wrong. I think the last couple of days, we've been doing our own, you know, broader Mulikam Jengo, where we're saying these 25 stories, whereas we accept that that is where we need to go, we need to plan uh, around the same thing. I think the second thing I'd like to say is that information is very important. Information is power. When you have um, leadership and governance where there's so much opaqueness in the way in which information is shared and, and distributed, and it's more of uh, you know, roadside declarations, as you've seen, then you end up having this uproar uh, by the citizens. What we need is we need a, a, you know, a governor who's very open and can say, look, 
I intend to do 25 stories. What do I need to do? What do I need to put in place? And he has all the machinery in terms of professionals and even the planning department uh, in, the, in the county to assist him to do the same. Uh, last but not least is to talk about uh, things to do with the legislation and things to do with plans and so on and so forth. We have the new plan, which needs to cascade to the local uh, physical development plans or you know, generally called area plans or neighborhood plans. So he, we need citizens to be able to participate in this and to be able to then feed into what we call the development control policy, which gives these ordinances. When you talk about ordinances, just to, to translate it is that it is these ordinances that will determine whether a place you know, suits 25 stories, 75 stories, even 100 floors, as much as would, would be required. And so that would feed uh, into a development control policy that, is, that has the buy-in of the citizenry in this country. And what we are trying to also say at the end of it all is that where we have elected leaders who have been given the authority by citizenry to lead the city, they need to listen to the city. They need to have them to participate in how they want their city to develop. And that is what democracy is all about. And what, we are, what my last word would be is that let's look towards having what you call a just city. A city that uh, dignifies the people in the city. It allows the citizens to have their rights and respons responsibilities in the city. These people all are also equitably, uh, uh, you know, looked at. For especially when you talk about the youth, people, persons with disability, women and children across our city. And last but not least, is that people should participate in how they want their city to be built. And that is what democracy is all about. Mm, Thank you. Absolutely. Flores Nyoli, President of the Architectural Association of Kenya. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. And I think it was a very good conversation there. Philip Kisi, as usual, don't wait 10 years to come back on the show. I mean, come on. Come on. <laughs> Keep inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your input. You guys, this is a great debate. And it's continuing.